Hey, good afternoon, guys. This is Nicology. We're down in uh, southern New Hampshire today in a bog, in a nice kettle hole bog, uh, in search of uh, what I hope is, uh, uh, or should I say, hoping to see a really nice uh, species of orchid because uh, I've been getting kind of bored of the lady slippers, frankly. And as much as I love Cypripedia McCall, the pink lady slipper, we're going to be looking at something uh, maybe a bit different today. Uh, right now I'm walking through just a, a thicket of uh, blueberry bushes, um, you know, which we've seen plenty of times before. Uh, you get an Angustifolium and Corumbosum uh, here. You get some uh, leather leaf down there. I'll put the scientific name. Not sure if that's uh, yet to bloom or has already bloomed. I forget what the phenology is on that. But uh, uh, I didn't think that that would be in bloom right now. Uh, member Vericaceae. Blueberries, of course, are Member Vericaceae. Tons of... Uh, I mean, frankly, tons of diversity in that in that plant family uh, here in New England. But uh, I'm going to quit yapping and put my phone down and actually, you know, come across some stuff because uh, we could potentially be looking at quite a few uh, species of plant today. So uh, let's get to it. Okay, so it wouldn't be a New England bog without a uh, Calmia angustifolia here. There's another one there. And these guys are uh, honestly just wrapping up for the year, I think. Supposedly Calmia polifolia here. Which, uh, I mean, this is a bad example because this guy's uh, flowers are coming out of the terminal end, but he's still got the world leaves that Angustifolia has, and that one does too. Uh, Polifolia has got the opposite leaves, and then the uh, inflorescences at the terminal end of the plant. You know, member of Ericaceae, just like these blueberries that are growing everywhere. There's Huckleberry here. There's, there's just about all shapes and forms of uh, Ericaceae that you can imagine. It's still nice to see. Hopefully we can see polifolia. Okay, here's as good a spot of any to uh, explain kind of uh, what we're looking at here, what we're dealing with in the bog. So functionally, we're standing on a floating mat of a uh, uh, sphagnum, which is which is this down here. It's a type of moss, sphagnum moss. I'll put the uh, scientific name there for you. And essentially, there's just a mat of this stuff floating over uh, a kettle hole which is a, you know, a big scoop out of the earth that retreating glaciers would have taken. And what it creates is a highly acidic, highly anoxic, you know, lacking oxygen, and highly nutrient deficient plant community where uh, members of Ericaceae obviously thrive. I mean, we're looking at high brush blueberry right here. This is a uh, Vaccinium corumbosum, rhododendron thrives in here, obviously calmia, which we already saw, but then also certain types of orchids that are, you know, tapped into this mycorrhiza that all these, uh, you know, blueberry has to associate with it. Um, basically, any plant that's going to thrive in a habitat like this needs to have, or will typically have, some sort of adaptation to that, whether that be association with mycorrhiza for the members of Ericaceae, or... Um, uh, carnivory, which I'm hoping we'll see because there's supposed to be two species of Drosera known from this area. Also uh, bladder warts, but I don't think those are in season quite yet. And uh, frankly, it just makes for an incredibly interesting and, uh, uh, you know, somewhat unique plant community. Obviously, you get bogs all over all over the world, but, you know, New England bogs were, were formed relatively recently in the terms of geologic time. I mean, this was probably dug out between 40 and 8,000 years ago by a summer treating glacier. Uh, another um, uh, plant you've got growing here, you've got maples, um, of which I'm not certain the species I'm currently standing under. You've got obviously Vaccinium corumbosum, and then uh, right here, a, a species of birch, gray birch, uh, um, be Betula, Betula, whatever, however it's pronounced, uh, in the species epithet. I can't remember right now, but this is a gray birch right in front of us, and you can see those uh, fairly distinct looking birch leaves up there. Um, and I think you also get river birch. Um, I'll take a, a picture of the leaves and I'll, I'll key out which one this is, if this is river birch or if this is gray birch. But um, nice to see the birches, lots of diversity in the genus um, Betula here in uh, New England. There's a birch and a maple growing together like that. And uh, making the most out of an extremely nutrient poor, uh, you know, uh, environment. Uh, you know, thanks to the, the sphagnum moss just kind of laying down and uh, creating a um, <laughs> just a really, really chemically interesting 
substrate for the stuff to grow on. So we're going to keep going. The actual bog is a bit down this way. I just wanted to stop here because it was a nice spot where you can, uh, they were kind enough to put these boards out so we can actually walk over what we're talking about. All right. And on that note, let's go. Okay, it's already gone to seed for the year. It already bloomed. Probably just finished up a few weeks ago. But we've got a rhododendron canadens here. The ro rotora is the common name. And uh, again, another member, Ericaceae. Actually, these are probably the fruits from last year. They already dehissed. These are probably the, these are the fruits from this year. And, uh, you know, people get this stuff growing outside of their house. Usually different cultivars. Leaves are bigger. But, uh, yeah, let's take a look at those leaves. Different than another rhododendron I commonly see, rhododendron girl and come, which would have those nice, uh, the nice uh, almost copper-colored uh, undersides to those leaves. Kind of fuzzy, kind of rough. Nice plant. Uh, you know, not going off right now, but you know that's okay. The big boy of a uh, uh, vaccinium corymbosum over there, vaccinium corymbosum over there, and then rhododendron canadens right here. Canadian rhododendron, rotora, goes by a few different names. And then coming up behind us is still Calmia angustifolia, another rhododendron right there, and then the birches. This is a beautiful community. This is a, it's cold right now, and if I uh, didn't know any better, I'd feel like I was up in an alpine bog, you know, 3,000 feet up a mountain in the whites. But even though these are, you know, from the same genus, as a lot of those plants I'm used to seeing, uh, the families are different, uh, not the families, the species are different. So you, you would get, you know, rhododendrons at that level, but it would be rhododendron grown land to come instead of, you know, rhododendron canadens. You would get birches up in that environment, but instead of a gray birch, it would be a paper birch. And of course you get plenty of conifers, but instead of these, uh, I believe these are all, these are all pitch pines. Instead of Pinus rigida, you'd have, obviously, um, black spruce and uh, balsam fir. So, similar-esque habitat is going to produce similar plants. Oh, and of course, instead of Drosera, which we haven't seen a Drosera yet, you would see a lot more uh, pitcher plants. You'd see the Saracenias up there, which I saw this time last year up on the uh, Kinsman Range. Um, you know, just... Uh, you're going to get commonalities in, in a similar type of ecosystem. You're going to see uh, similar types of plants. You know, imagine that. I told you we would see some really cool stuff today, and I'm happy to know that I wasn't wrong. We've got not one, but two species of carnivorous plant here. And these are actually not two distant relatives of uh, Venus flytraps. These are in the same family, Drosseraceae. We get two species of Drossera right here. We have Drossera Intermedia, the spatulate-leaved Drosera. You can see, you'll note that those uh, petioles there, and these are the leaves, by the way, that are modified with those sticky glands to capture insect prey, uh, do not have hairs on them. And then if we look over here at his cousin, uh, where is he? Sorry, these guys are diminutive. Drosera, oh, he's got bugs in there right now. Drosera rotundifolia. You'll note that those petioles are quite pubescent and hairy. And the, uh, the leaf itself there, is a different shape than Drosera intermedia. Two different species of Drosera, families Drosseraceae, same family as the Venus flytrap, growing right next to each other. And the reason why they're doing this, why they're growing here, and then why they have this uh, specific adaptation to capture insects, uh, is simply because there's no nutrients in the soil. This is how they're getting their nitrogen. And I mean, there are bugs crawling around all over the place here, but this is how these guys are getting their you know, their nitrogen fix, how they're getting their nutrients. They've adapted to this nutrient-poor anoxic soil, or not even soil, substrate, by uh, evolving to capture insects. Um, Drosseraceae is a family that has three uh, genera in it. One, of course, being Dionia, which has the, uh, you know, Venus flytrap. The other being Drossera, which has hundreds of species. In fact, neither of these two plants are rare. I think they both occur... Um, up and down the eastern seaboard, and they have a circumboreal description, uh, sorry, uh, circumboreal um, distribution, and you can find them in Europe, you can find them anywhere else, you'll get a bog like this. But I mean, man, it's really, really cool to see something that's oftentimes just sold as a novelty growing here. And to see both the two different species right here is nice. Um, 
I think there are six total species known from New England, but quite a few of them you only find up in far, far northern Maine. Um, there's another one that occurs down on the Cape, and then these two species, Intermedia and uh, Rotundifolia, uh, tend to be a little bit more widely distributed. And I mean, these things are these things are tiny, tiny, tiny little plants. So cool to see them in person. Yeah, I mean, I don't know why you wouldn't love coming out to the bogs, but you gotta come out to the bogs. I mean, these draws are, they're just, they're just everywhere. You got a couple of uh, individuals of intermedia right here. And I don't know why, you know, they speciate like that. You know, they seem to be growing in the same area, but you know, these ones are a little bit smaller than the ones I saw back there. Just using their sticky glands to trap insects. And, they, and then they, uh, then they, uh, do that they roll up on them and then they digest them for their nitrogen um intermedia appears to be uh the one that's a little bit more abundant here but rotundifolia oh no you got rotundifolia up over there rotundifolia i believe is technically <clears throat> the most widely distributed at least in this area so you'll see those quite often and then we get another uh nice plant right here which i almost just missed if i hadn't uh stopped here for a second to film geez these tiny little white flowers here this is a species of vaccinium believe it or not this is a uh, vaccinium oxycocos i think is how you pronounce it this is the bog cranberry so this is a little bit different than vaccinium macrocarpon the american uh cranberry this is the bog cranberry and basically i believe what differentiates is uh, them it's the fact that the uh bog cranberry is absolutely diminu diminutive uh, like this guy is coming up in a little blanket of sphagnum moss with a uh, drosera and uh, other ericaceous plants. Family on this guy is ericaceae because what else would you expect from an environment like this? But that's a, a he's he's so small, but tiny. There you go. There's a better view of that uh, vaccinium flower, vaccinium oxycocos, bog cranberry. Damn, so small. It appears I was not entirely truthful. When I said that we wouldn't be seeing Saracenia out here, because that right there, my friends, is the uh, flower of Saracenia purpurea, which is the uh, purple pitcher plant, which is our, you know, native member of the family Saracenia. So if I see that one flower, hopefully we'll be able to see some growing along the trail, because that's quite a ways through a very sensitive and fragile habitat that I am not the type of monster to go ahead and trample. But I mean, carnivory as an adaptation. Look at it. It's all these. All carnivorous plants. Or, uh, by the way, order on both the Saracenia over there and the Drosera here. I know I said Droseraceae is the family for these. Saraceniaceae is the family for that guy. But these are both... Uh... Okay, slow your roll there, big guy. What I was about to say was that Droseraceae and Saraceniaceae are both families in the order Caryophyllales, which, while true for Droseraceae, is not true for Saraceniaceae. Saraceniaceae is in the order Ericales, which is the same order as the blueberry family Ericaceae, which we've already spoken about a few times in this video, and it's actually most closely related to the families Actinidiaceae, the kiwi family, oddly enough, and Merigulaceae, which is a super interesting family of two African coprophytic plants, a fancy way of saying that they eat shit, that trap bugs but use the feces of the predatory insects feeding on the trapped bugs for nutrients rather than the bugs themselves really interesting but uh, not really related to new england botany okay my friends what we have here is we've got another wonderful carnivorous plant this is a uh, saracenia purpurea this is a pitcher plant one of several different uh you know uh order uh not orders well i guess orders but uh families is what i mean that pitcher plants can occur in these are in the family saraceniaceae Okay, here we go again. So as I already said, Saracenia is in the family Saraceniaceae. But what I have to explain at this point is the fact that you actually get three completely unrelated families of pitcher plants. Saraceniaceae, Dependaceae, and Cephalotaceae. This is a classic case of convergent evolution in testament to the efficacy of using modified leaves to trap prey. Saraceniaceae is an Ericales, the same order as the blueberry family Ericaceae, which I already said. Nepenthaceae, now they call these the old world, meaning that they're from uh, the east side of the Atlantic. So think Asia, Europe, Africa, I guess technically Australia. Um, 
I don't like using that term because it just implies that the Americas were discovered and we don't have to get into it. I prefer tropical pitcher plant, even though that is also a bit of a misnomer because there are tropical members of Saraceniaceae. But anyway, we don't have to get into it. Uh, you get these in the Southeast Asian tropics. You also get them on the uh, eastern side of the island of Madagascar. And then I think you even get them in the northeast corner of Australia. So Nepenthesia is in the order Caryophyllales. So it's more closely related to spinach, cacti, beets, etc. cetera, uh, than it is to Saraceniaceae or this final family of pitcher plants, Cephalotaceae, which consists of one species restricted to the far southwest corner of Australia. And that's in the order Oxalidales, which if you're in the Northeast like I am, um, the only thing probably super familiar to you uh, from that order is the genus Oxalis, uh, which goes by the common name wood sorrel, um, which is the type genus for the family Oxalidaceae, which is the essentially the core family to that entire order, Oxalidales. But that's way too much to focus on for a video about New England botany, and we're just going to focus on Saracenia papuria, the only uh, species you really get up here in New England. Okay, my friends, you truly and simply must, you know, come out to your local bogs if you're in, you know, New England. I, I can't even stress to you how nice this habitat is. We've got cranberry trailing there, the drosera, the sundews, doing just fine, doing great in fact. Saracenia purpurea, carnivorous purple pitcher plant. There's one in flower. In fact, there's a whole bunch in flower. There's some done right there, finished up flowering uh, for the year. Uh, an exceptionally healthy looking Saracenia purpurea. You can see how it got its name. That one grew a little bit too high up and dried out. This one down here is doing just fine. Uh, Saracenia papuria, Saracenia papuria. There they are. There's some more of those dried out flowers. There's a massive one down there. All right. More of uh, those dried out flowers, more Saracenia, more Drosera, just everywhere. Saracenia and Drosera. And there's that orchid. Oh, it's a shame none of these guys are growing uh, too close to the edge. Uh, where, where'd the orchid go? There he is right there. I gotta. I, I know that there. I see some down here. I'm gonna get closer. They're all clustered in here with the with the pitcher plants. Just so many of them. It's unbelievable. This is such a cool, such a cool thing to come out and see. All right, we're gonna we're gonna uh, break this down. Uh, I've talked enough about Saracenia. That's the orchid that I wanted to look at. That was my target plant for today, and I'm gonna bring you over to them because I think I see some growing along the edge down over here. And if not, we'll come back and I'll talk about this guy in just a second. Let me get let me get my bearings real quick. I'm I'm, I'm too excited. It really doesn't get much cooler than this. Calipogon tuberosus here. Family is Orchidaceae. Everybody loves orchids. I know. Obviously, everybody. If you live in New England, you're familiar with the pink lady slipper. Super Petey McCall. This is uh, in a completely different subfamily of Orchidaceae. Obviously, Orchidaceae is the largest family of flowering plants in the world. There's something like 35,000 different species of orchid, something like uh, 3,000 different genera. And uh, this guy is coming up here with the uh, Saracenia papuria. I just saw a there's some in flower. There's the Saracenia flowers. There's another one of those Calipogon flowers, Calipogon tuberosa, and then just a swarm of Drosera in that uh, small bog cranberry, just forming a highly ideal bog, northern uh, New England bog habitat. There's more of that Calipogon tuberosa uh, coming up with the Calmia and Gustafolia. Still haven't seen Polifolia. Still haven't seen the uh, the larch tree, unless I'm just stupid and I, I'm missing the obvious, which which is a is an honest reality. But uh, I mean, you couldn't ask for a, a cooler. Um, I mean, just a cooler habitat. Orchids, carnivorous plants, plants thriving in nutrient deficient um, uh, substrate. Up over there, we've got uh, some uh, Nymphaea odorata coming in, some of the water lilies, and just Saracenia in bloom, dude. This is, uh, is kind of like my ideal sort of habitat to check out. 
Um, a lot of these spruce trees you guys have been seeing in the background, these are all Picea mariana. These are the same black spruce that you actually get up in the mountains. So I was, I was incorrect when I said that we would be seeing some different trees, but they're supposed to be Larix larcinia, I believe it's how it's pronounced around here too. I, I, my only, the only thing I wish is that I could grab a hold of one of those uh, Saracenia flowers and show you up close because they got some, they got some weird morphology, dude. Some real weird morphology. And then, of course, uh, like I said, Picea mariana, well adapted to the nutrient-poor habitat, too. That's the same guy you see up in the White Mountains growing with the balsam fir. How freaking cool is this? Give you one last shot of those orchids. Calipogon tuberosa. Hey, I don't think that's quite right, my friend. Banger of a plant, dude. No, no offense to the lady slippers, but, I mean, you've seen one. You've seen them all. Or not, you, you know what I mean. I, I see him every time I go out. I, let me see a different type of orchid for once. Take a couple more pictures of this guy. And then we'll keep walking around and see what else we got. Okay, so speaking of Saracenia's weird flower morphology, let's talk about Calipogon tuberosus's weird flower morphology. Because I wasn't aware of this at the time I filmed the video. So I really do not want to make this into a whole lecture on orchid morphology. It's weird, it's varied, it's bizarre, and I'll be completely blunt, uh, the temperate North American orchids are barely scratching the surface of, you know, what orchid morphology can look like. There's some weird stuff out there. Go look it up on your own time. For right now, we're going to talk about resupinate flowers. Most orchids are resupinate flowers. That essentially just means they've been rotated 180 degrees upside down from what would be considered traditional flower morphology. Calipogon tuberosus is unusual because it's a non-resupinate orchid, meaning that it is in the uh, layout of your typical flower. So now what that means is that these little feathery bits up at the top, where uh, one would typically expect to see the uh, stamens of an orchid or pollinia because orchids typically have pollinia not stamens again we're not going to get into the whole morphology thing just know that a pollinia is a little sack of pollen and it's a very effective way to get a lot of pollen in one condensed little sack to you know another flower so a pollinator flies up to these fake stamens thinks he's going to get some pollen doesn't but what he does get is a dumped onto the pollinia down here below because this little uh, uh, this little petal here with these fake stamens is actually hinged. Orchids are notorious for this. They don't really like giving up pollen. They don't really like giving up nectar, but they've devised uh, so many different ways of essentially just tricking insects and other pollinators into pollinating them. There is some wild stuff out there Again, this is just scratching the surface. Just wanted to really quick mention that these uh, calipogon flowers are doing something pretty cool to get, get themselves pollinated and to reproduce. Anyway, we're going to go talk about Saracenia flowers, I think, right after uh, I end this segment. My friends, we've lucked out. We got a trail side seat here to see a, uh, there's the pictures down there. Saracenia purpurea flowering. So here's that flower. And here's the voiceover to explain what's actually going on because I got a couple things wrong. So the red things up top that look like petals, those are actually the sepals. The petals are long gone off of this flower. That green umbrella looking thing on the bottom, that's actually the style. So that's part of the female reproductive part, a heavily modified style. And what you're going to see here is a little dot on the inside. That's the stigma. That's the uh, plant cervix, so to speak. And then that ball there in the middle, that's the fruit. That's the ovary. So they have these really weird modified styles because you got to remember stigma style ovary uh, that essentially just make sure that whatever pollinator gets in there just really gets up against those uh, those little stigmas. Uh, quite bizarre. Uh, really freaks me out the first time I saw one. And yeah, you can see once they once they really ripen up, those uh, ovaries will turn uh, brown and you get a bunch of seeds in there. But uh, doing the thing where they grow their flowers high above the pitcher, you can see the pitcher's all the way down there. You get about a 14 inch stock above it, you know, cause obviously you don't want your pollinators falling into your traps, but uh, they got weird flowers. They got some pretty weird flowers. 
Anyway, back to the regular content. Look, here's another one. There are the pictures down there. Here's the flower. Thing feels like leather, by the way. There's that heavily modified, modified uh, stigma. And this guy still has one of the anthers there. Still hanging on to one single anther. I don't know how many it has when it first uh, opens up. I think maybe, probably, I mean, probably five. But uh, anything trapped down there in those pictures, my friend? Does not appear to be so. <sighs> Piscia Mariana, looking like hell. Get some old bastard uh, Pinus Rigidas over there, Pitch Pines. I, again, unless I just am losing my mind and I don't know what a larch tree looks like, or I guess technically a larch would refer to Larix decidua. Um, we're looking for Larix uh, larcinia, which is the, I guess you could call it an American larch, but they got the European larch, uh, is somewhat uh, naturalized out here too. I don't know if this specific spot, but I digress. Uh, yeah, these are some tortured uh, spruce trees uh, <laughs> suffering from the soil substrate and, uh, you know, not able to eat bugs like that guy is. But, uh, yeah, Pinus rigida, Picea mariana, maybe, maybe larch. There's some wolf lichen on that, uh, on that uh, uh, spruce tree right there, which, again, with how cold it is today, it's like 60 degrees. And this time last year, it was fucking 90 Um you know, yeah, it really gives me the vibe of, you know, being up there in the uh, White Mountains, like 3,000 feet of elevation. This time of year would feel like this, but, uh, and look similar to this, but, you know, this is uh, fascinating. There's some of the cones on that uh, black spruce there. So even though this guy is, you know, struggling to survive, it looks like he still produced uh, some fresh cones this year. Or maybe last year. I don't know if they do the same thing that the pines do where they take, you know, they can take over a year for the cones to mature and complete a full cycle and open up. But those are those are certainly a lot newer than those cones down there. So it did recently produce new growth in cones. And the uh, Blue Jays are complaining about something. But uh, let's keep going, man. This has been crazy. This might even be, this might be as interesting as the episode I do up on Mount Washington. Like I said, they just got a huge ice storm up there yesterday. Had to they had to rescue a bunch of people I heard, and uh, that might have uh, you know shut down the flowering season, and they'll try again next year. But then again, as we'll see, those plants are highly adapted to that type of community, so you know that might not be the case. We might still be in luck. All right, let me put my phone down because if I'm filming, I'm not paying attention, and I want to show you guys all this cool shit. Interesting one here because I saw it, you know, yeah, coming up with the picture plants, hello fellows. Coming up here with the pitcher plants, we get a real interesting member of the uh, family Ericaceae. Now, this looks like rosemary, but your first indication that it's not should, number one, be where it's growing. Rosemary. Oh, there's some sundews down in there, too. Jesus Christ, it's so cool here. It's such a cool area. Uh, number one, your first indication should be that this has opposite leaves. Rosemary, of course, has... Uh, I'm sorry, this has alternate leaves. Rosemary, of course, has opposite leaves. Um, this feels nothing like rosemary. This actually feels like plastic crushed a little leaf smells a little thing like rosemary but it does have those undersides that do you know for a second trip you up and make you think you're dealing with rosemary but this is a member of the heath family this is actually a, a monotypic genus this is andromeda this is andromeda polifolia and uh i knew i was expecting to see this plant but i figured it would um maybe still be flowering i, I had hoped but um i think we might be a bit too late for it to be uh in flower but this is the first time we've come across it so you never know we might we might have a pleasant surprise um and catch it in flower because this does have the uh, blueberry like vaccinioid uh ursulate corollas that are so frequent in the family ericaceae and of course also you know trademark of ericaceae it loves the cold the damp the nutrient poor and the generally inhospitable to uh <laughs> nutrient demanding uh plants Andromeda polifolia. Anytime you think you see rosemary in a bog up here in the northeast, probably this plant. Not a terribly rare plant, I do not believe, as long as you know what to look for and where to look for it. Cool one. Maybe if we get lucky, which we've gotten very lucky today, so I'm not trying to look a gift horse to the mouth, but we might just uh, see it in bloom. Okay, we found another, uh, another little patch of that uh, Colopogon... Uh, 
Colopogon tuberosa. And I, what I was curious about, which I couldn't see before, is where does this thing come up from? I think it's just that, just that one little leaf, as many orchids do, because he's, uh, you know, tapping into the, uh, tapping into whatever's going on here in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, mycorrhizal ecology. I would imagine. We've also got a. Oh, I just saw. I just lost it. Got some more of those uh, uh, Vaccinium oxycocos flowering. And in fact, you can see some of the cranberries starting to develop down here. It's much smaller than the uh, uh, Vaccinium uh, macrocarpon cranberries, which are the commercial cranberries that you uh, eat and drink if you so choose to enjoy cranberry juice. Yeah, there's, there's a good one right down there with the Drosera. We already looked at that flower though. We we gotta, you know. We can't we can't we can't stop every single time we see something nice if it's something we've already seen a bunch. Dross are going crazy. Would have been cool to see those in flower, but I don't think those will be blooming until next month. I think those come out and come out in July and just call a pogon everywhere over here. Just a, a beautiful uh <laughs> beautiful uh orchid. Epidendroidae, I think, is the specific subfamily of it. I'll put it below. I know what subfamily it is. I might just be saying it wrong. Um, this is the largest. This comes from the largest subfamily of orchids. Um, you get five subfamilies of orchid. Um, Cypripedia macaws and a different one. That's in the Cypripoidae uh, subfamily of orchids. But this is by far the largest family of orchids. I think this subfamily has uh, more species in it than the rest of the subfamilies combined. So this is... Uh, common in the tropics but you know if you're from up here you're probably just used to seeing um probably just used to seeing cypripedia mccall in a common setting um that bog rosemary's growing all over the place here andromeda none of it's in flower i think we're i think we're a bit too late to catch it in flower that's a uh you know a, a may bloomer i think so that's that's done um but yeah so this guy is just you know he's probably mooching off of um some fungus or some of the plants in the soil I'll look it up. I didn't. I didn't think to look up where it gets its. Uh, or actually, I didn't see it when I looked it up. But he's just got that one leaf and a photosynthetic stem, as many orchids do. A lot of orchids uh, are parasitic or uh, mycorrhizal, um, and they generally don't do, you know, that much of their, um, you know, nutrient gathering themselves. But like I said, you're growing on pure sphagnum here, just feet away from, uh, feet away from the water there. Oh, you got a uh, Lizamachia over there. Species of loose strife. Um, not not the same one that we uh, not Lizamachia quadrifolia, world loose strife, or Lizamachia borealis, obviously, which is the star flower. But that's um, I know what that one is. Maybe we'll see it. I didn't think it was going to be blooming yet, but there it is. So if we we might come across that guy because I still got I still got a decent amount of trail to walk through, but. Uh, I keep getting stopped because these guys are absolute freaking stunners. And just everything that you're seeing flowering out there. Those are the Saracenia flowers, Colopogon flowers. Over here, I actually saw something that kind of caught me by surprise. I knew it was listed on INAT from here, but I didn't expect to see it. That was Peltandra, Peltandra virginica. First and only one I've seen so far. And then uh, right there appears to be, uh, if I could zoom in, the other species of cranberry we get that that looks like vaccinia macrocarpon that's about twice as big as the other ones we've seen um oxycocos is a little bit more common around here but i think that the uh you know that's the so-called american cranberry whereas uh, oxycocos is the so-called bog cranberry but i believe that's the one uh the bigger of the two species and um the one that gets harvested for um you know commercial commercial uh cranberry harvests but uh I, I can't i can't get to it because it's you know I'm, I'm i'm standing on a platform right now but uh god what a absolutely phenomenal habitat and just to think it's all caused by a uh glacier just uh digging a hole in the ground and then that hole just being filled in with vegetative matter that just can't decompose got a ton of those uh, nymphaea odorata over there still a plant i see all the time but one i've never had the opportunity to actually get up close to and look at but uh we're gonna go over to that platform over there and see if we can see anything else but oh my god 
What a cool day. Okay, so good to know I wasn't crazy. We have not come across a large, uh, uh, I guess, tamarack, I should say. The American uh, species of this is frequently called tamarack, not larch. This is uh, Larix uh, larcinia, the um, tamarack tree. This is a deciduous conifer. It's a member of the pine family. And as you can see, as opposed to uh, the pines there with the fascicles of uh, usually two, three, or five needles on the East Coast, especially since you're dealing mostly with Pinus strobus, which is five needles per fascicle. This has many needles per fascicle, and you can see the fascicles run pretty much down the entire length of the uh, of the stem there, the branch, whatever you want to call it. Now this, like I said, is a deciduous conifer, meaning that this guy is not evergreen. In the fall, this thing lights up beautiful yellow, and it drops its needles for the winter and goes uh, deciduous. Um, common myth that you know only conifers are evergreen actually i think a lot of people know not only conifers are evergreen but i think a lot of people think all conifers are evergreen uh larix the genus both species in it i think there's only the two species that could be wrong are um deciduous in fact the european larch larix decidua that's where the species epithet comes from. And then also bald cypresses tend to lose their needles uh, in the wintertime as well. And I mean, I think there might be some other conifers. And then certainly, um, you know, that's that's just talking about, uh, you know, ones that I'm familiar with. I'm sure if you go into some of the other, you know, families in, um, not Pinophyta, I guess, yeah, technically Pinophyta, that clade, um, Pinales is what I was actually referring to. So Cupressaceae, Aracaraceae, Aracaraceae. You know what I mean? The, the ones down there in Australia, New Zealand and stuff. Uh, and then obviously Pinaceae, which is what this is in. I think you, there's a few, you know, there's a few across those different families that have uh, deciduous species in them. So I have not seen this guy. Apparently these are growing everywhere here, but um, uh, this is the first uh, Larix larch tree or a tamarack tree, whatever you want to call it, I've seen. And just uh, take a look at those fascicles once again. That's pretty interesting. It's a neat conifer coming up uh, in a uh, blueberry bush. So maybe we'll see some more because these aren't, this isn't as big as they get. And they thrive in a, just like Pinus rigida does right there. They thrive, you know, in this type of habitat. Okay, here's a healthier looking large tree coming up with uh, Pinus rigida and coming up with Picea. Mariana kind of interspersed some weird, uh, the, the conifers are duking it out here. Um, no fresh cones on this guy, but he does have, uh, the remnants of, um, some of the old cones. That's a bad example. You know, no, no freshies on them though, but, uh, kind of, kind of glaucous. This is not, this is not a stiff foliage either. This is quite soft. I don't know. And here's, this is going to be a new branch coming out. I don't know. Um, <sighs> If these guys just get started right now, I would imagine you're a conifer. You probably like to spend as much time as possible photosynthesizing. But uh, whatever. Let's take a look at that Pinus rigidicone. Oh, they're so freaking sharp. Now, that was nice and soft. This is a nasty. This is a nasty cone. You look at that burr up there. I wonder if that's a that's a newly pollinated cone or or what. But uh, this is this is sharp. This hurts to touch. And when they dry out. They only get even sharper, but just look at that freaking bark, dude. What a tough bastard of a tree. You know, Pinus rigida, man. You gotta give it to this thing. This thing will grow when none of the other pines would even bother. It's uh, restricted to the kind of bottomland habit, though. I don't. You don't get this up in the mountains. You know, the, uh, the Picea mariana, which can also take similar conditions, but doesn't grow I, nearly as big or nearly as aggressively. Or not nearly as big. It, it doesn't get quite as big as the uh, Pinus rigidus can. But these are not large trees either. These are, you know, a medium, medium-sized tree, you could say. But just, oh my God, look. It's freaking codes. It's armored. Oh, you're so nasty, but I love you. Yeah, okay, we got we to gotta wrap this one up soon. Number one, because I'm absolutely just eating through uh, storage on my phone. I'm hoping to catch uh, Colmia polifolia. I mean, we get Calmia growing right here, but that's Angustifolia. I'm going to try and see if I can find that other species of Calmia, and then I'll show you. I saw that Lizamachia, that uh, loose strife again, the uh, swamp loose strife or bog loose strife, whatever they call it. So I'll definitely show you that real quick. 
and then uh, if my phone survives and I happen to come across it, I can show you the uh, that other species of Calmia. But we gotta get going. Okay, kind of a lackluster and abrupt end to the video here. My phone's about to die. Uh, I didn't see the polyfolia. Call me a polyfolia, but that's okay. I'm thinking maybe the uh, phenology is a little bit different on that guy, and he might bloom a different time of the year. But we can always come back and look for it again. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to wrap this up before my phone died. We saw so much good stuff today. And uh, I'm hi hiking out of the bog right now anyway. So I hope that you are enticed to come back in the future. Because I'll have more good stuff for you. Anyway, take it easy. And hopefully I'll see you again soon. Okay, my phone's basically dead. But here you go. Lizomachia terrestris. The uh, bog loose strife. Uh, not quite open unfortunately. But will be soon. And, uh, you know, just the last... Last thing I can show you, because my phone's going to die. I don't even think I'm going to find that call me anyway. There's another one.